Okay, let's get started. Um, all right, let's uh, look briefly at uh, bipartite matching again to uh, recap what we did last time. So, bipartite matching is the following problem: you are given a, a a bipartite graph, and a matching is a set of edges which don't share any vertices, right? Uh, so that's you can also think of it as an independent set in the set of edges. Two edges don't in intersect if they share a vertex. So uh, a more uh, useful practical way of thinking about matching is you think of the left side assigning the left side to things on the right side. Okay. So it, it's a, the, the practical application of matching comes from treating it as an assignment problem. So what is it an assignment problem? You have some things like jobs or uh, objects or uh, ads or something like that you, you think of as vertices on the left side. On the right side are things like machines, people, um, something where you can uh, allocate resources, right? And you want to assign these uh, jobs to the machines or you want to assign ads to slots, or, okay? So naturally then the, the, what are the edges the edges represent can this job be done by this person right you know you only add edges from a job to a person if the person can do the job okay so then in that context a matching is nothing but an assignment which has a property that you know each job is assigned to only one person and each person gets only one job okay okay but more generally uh, assignment problems come up uh, in uh, uh, with more more uh, uh, without uh, without that kind of simple simple uh, restriction, uh, you know there is no reason to have a constraint that a, a person can do only one job or something, right? So what if you know each person can do ten jobs, right? And you want to assign jobs to people so that the person doesn't get more than ten jobs, right? So now each person has some capacity, and maybe there are many jobs of the same type, right? You know there are ten carpentry jobs, okay? And you want to assign all ten carpentry jobs. So you have a single vertex for each carpentry job, uh, but there are ten of them, okay? You don't care which people you assign to as long as they can do the job, right? And uh, each person may have a capacity saying, I can't do more than so many jobs, right? So you can easily model that also as a network flow where the capacity of the edge from the source to that vertex now has, is, depends on how many you want to assign and how many the person can receive, okay? So assignment problems are generalizations of bipartite matching where there are numbers associated with each side which tell us how many copies of the job or how many copies of that person are, are there, more or less, okay? So that's also easily reduced to bipartite uh, as a network flow, right? When you add source to that vertex, you put capacity there instead of putting capacity one, okay? So there are many applications because it's a very powerful model. Now, uh, and then, you know, we'll see some variations where you can put costs and, and, and so you get uh, many other applications, okay? So, what we're going to do now uh, is uh, 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 is uh, look at uh, um, look at one more one application which is uh, kind of interesting, which involves assignment basically. So you'll see assignment in a concrete example, but it also kind of uh, tells you that you have to think a little bit about how to use assignment problem or flow. The, the art of figuring out for a given problem that you can actually solve it via assignment or maximum flow or other problems is, is actually very important in algorithm design, right? Most of the time, you know, you, are, you have a vaguely specified problem and you have your tools, right? You have techniques like dynamic programming, you know, greedy algorithms or local search. But more important than all those things are what problem does it look like? Can I model it as a problem that I already know how to solve? Because it's unlikely that you'll come up with brand new 
techniques for each specific problem that is very hard to do, right. Sometimes you have to, but very often you want to see how to reduce a given problem to an existing problem and that is not always easy, right. That, that's also it. That is essentially an algorithmic skill, reducing to an existing problem, right. So here is a simple, uh, 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 you know, uh, not all of you are uh, baseball fans or maybe sports fans, right. Uh, and some of you don't know baseball, right? Uh, if you're an international student, maybe you may or may not know, right? I've been in this country long enough that at some point when I had a lot more time, I used to watch a bunch of baseball when I was in New York and the Yankees were doing well and stuff. Uh, and now we're in the fourth season of baseball, right? So already, uh, you know, we know who is playing, you know, the Cubs are hopefully going to the World Series. Uh, but uh, uh, in general, you know, if you are a sports fan and you like baseball, before, you know, teams get to the postseason, right, that means that they are playing all this, a lot of games, right, about 161 or something like that, right. Towards the end of the season, there is a big uh, um, excitement about who is going to go to the postseason, right, because some teams are already very good, but other teams are kind of uh, and I, all the sports fans are like figuring out, you know, who is going to get to the postseason, you know, there are so many games left and, right. So, so let us see that, that in action, right, you know, uh, how does the picture look like, right. You know, this is actually, uh, a, you know, a example of that. Uh, this is the American League, for some of you who may know the background, you know, there are, uh, there are more teams, I think, than this, uh, maybe there, yeah, I think there are. No, this is, I think there are more teams, but let's say there are only four teams for simplicity, right? Uh, so this is the Yankees, the uh, you know Orioles and Blue Jays and Red Sox, right? So what does the at any point you know when you're thinking about uh, the postseason, what does the picture look like? They've already played a lot of games, right? So the picture looks like this: uh, the, the teams have won this many games, and there are only this many left, okay? Now you want to know, you know, can Boston be the, win the pennant, what does it mean? Will Boston be the team which has the most number of wins among these four at the end of it? Okay, if I ask you that question, what will you do? Right? Oh, well, I mean, okay, say so winning the pennant means, uh, uh, well, in this case it is clear, right? Why? Because even if it wins the both the games, it will get 91 while Yankees already have 92, okay? Okay, so it is obvious in this case, right? Okay, but what if, uh, right, you know, you had this picture, okay? So now, you know, okay, winning the pennant means like let us say, you know, it's, it reaches the top, right? Okay, what if uh, Boston wins both games, okay? All right, then what can we say, right? You know, it gets 92, okay? Okay, Yankees have to lose both games, right? Otherwise, they will win, right? Okay, okay. Now it's, okay, Boston wins both games, Yankees lost both games, okay? But it also means that, you know, we, okay, Boston can win maximum of 92, right? What about Toronto and Baltimore? Can we figure out whether, what happens, right? If Yankees lose both games, maybe, you know, the only way Yankees can lose both games is because they have to play two games with Baltimore, right? In which case Baltimore would win, right? Okay. But we don't know, right? My claim is we don't have enough information here. Why don't we have enough, I mean, we can't tell, right? Why can't we tell? Because we don't know what the remain, who is playing what, right, in the remaining games, right. We don't have enough information to determine whether Boston can win the pennant, right. Because we, we don't know who, what, what these games are. We, I mean, they have, the two games left, but we don't know which, are, you know, who should Yankees play in those two games. Who should Boston play, right. Without knowing that, we can't determine the answer to this. But suppose I tell you that information, right. Then we can try all possibilities, right, and figure out if Boston can win in any one of those possibilities. Yeah, does it make sense? I claim that I don't have enough information here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I have to tell you, right? Okay. I have to tell you what information there is, right? So now here is the what I'll give you the information. This is the information I need, right? What is the information? The current set of wins 
how many games are left and who is going to play who in the rest of the games, right? Uh, I mean, this is a table, right? It says, you know, New York has one game left with Baltimore, one game is left with Toronto and blah, blah, right? Maybe there is, this can be two, two, you know, it depends on how many games, yeah? Okay, if I give you this information, we can figure out something, right? Okay, now how do we figure it out? Okay, we have to make Boston win all its games, right? That makes sense, right? Okay, okay, then New York must lose both games. We already figured that out, okay. Okay, now if New York loses both games, Baltimore and Toronto have at least 92 wins, right? Because one, New York has one game with Baltimore, one game with Toronto, okay? Okay, then what happens? They both have to have 92 wins then. But then they have a game with each other, right? Somebody has to win that game, right? All right? So Boston can't win the pennant, right? Okay? Okay. Now suppose, you know, this is an easy thing because why was this a little bit easy? Because the number of games is so small and the number of teams is so small, right? Yeah? So you could kind of do handcraft it, right? But suppose I, you know, I, I even keep the four, four teams here. Suppose these numbers are 10, 7, 8, 9 or something like that. And then I give you this table. How would you figure it out? Right? If you want to figure out, you know, can Boston win, it is a little tricky problem, right? You can try, figure it out by enumeration. You try all possibilities. You know, let's, okay, even let's think about even enumeration. How would you figure it out? If I came to you, in fact, this is a problem that people actually solve, right? You know, they are crazy about this problem, right? Because they, they want to know whether the team will win, right? You know, if you look at the newspapers uh, towards the end of the season, this is what they are doing, right? Okay, how are they figuring out if Boston can win or any particular team can win? How would you, suppose they came to you and said, it's getting a little complicated, you know, I need an algorithm for this. Okay, what would you suggest to them? Right? Yeah? No, but here you don't know who has won yet, right? You know, you're asking, is there a possibility of Boston winning the pennant by deciding the re remaining games in their favor? Is, is there a theoretical possibility of Boston winning the pennant or some team winning the pennant, right? So we figured out for this example that there is no way. Theoretically, it's impossible. It's, it, whatever happens, Boston cannot win the pennant. It's already lost, right? In, in this, if this is the situation, for, the answer is no. Right? If I change the data, answer could be yes. Right? So the question is, you know, that, that, that's what we want to know. Is there, okay, all right? So, okay, I want us to, okay, so I want us to think that uh, implicit in this is an assignment problem. Okay, what is it that we are assigning and what do we want out of that? We want to check whether there is some assignment possible, right? What is that? Okay, all right? So how do we think of it as an assignment problem, right? So what, what are we trying to do, right? In this game, okay, the first thing we need to do is we have to let Boston win all its games, right? That makes sense, okay? So then we know how many wins Boston will get, yeah? Okay, now when will Boston win the pennant if nobody else will win, get as many wins as Boston, right? Yeah? Okay, what does it mean, okay? What it means is that we have to assign each remaining game, each remaining game has to be won by one of the two teams, right? Okay? Yeah? Each, rem each remaining game has to be won by one of the two teams who's playing it. Okay? So what we want is, can we assign the remaining games to the teams with the condition that, you know, if the game is between New York and Baltimore, it can be assigned only to New York or Baltimore, right? So can we assign the remaining games to the teams that they are playing so that the total number of wins by any team is less than what Boston already has won? Because we already gave it all the remaining games. It has. Okay? Does it make sense? Okay. So let's uh, formalize this. 
uh, okay. But now you know we are want to solve this in a full generality, right? Not four teams and you know one two games or so on, right? We have how many? Well, let's look at it this way. We have a set of teams S, okay? That's say there is a number of teams, and for each team we have the current number of wins, right? W X, okay? And for any pair X Y in the two teams, we know how many games are left between them. So that's a number, right? G X Y, yeah. And we will have a specific team Z, and we want to know is Z going to win or not, right? That's the problem, right? In the abstract, right? We don't have four teams, but we have many teams, and this. So this is the data. What is the data? The number of teams, and how many games are there for each pair of teams? Uh, how many games are left, and, and, not, and also how many wins they already have? And I want to know is this team going to? Is there any possibility of this particular team winning the pennant, right? Okay. Okay, so uh, what does it mean to win the pennant? It means that you know the team has to win at least m games, and no other team wins more than m games. Okay, you can be if you want, you can make it m minus one if you want, right? But let's say you know if it matches the maximum, it wins. Okay, at least okay. is that okay? It's a definition. We'll go with this definition. If you want, we can define it more strictly and say it has to win m games and nobody else. Everybody else has to have at most m minus one. We can solve that also. It's not difficult. Okay, so this is what we want to decide. Okay, so it is obvious that to maximize this chance of winning, we have to give it all the games, right? That it has left. I mean, you know, there is no reason if it has a possibility of winning the pennant by losing. Clearly, by giving that game to it, it also will win, right? So we might as well give to Z all the remaining games it is going to play. Yeah. So what are we saying? You know, m must be the current set of wins for z, plus all the remaining games it has to play. So we give it to it already, right? Okay, that makes sense. Okay, now, now we have to decide. You know, no other team should win more than this m games, right? We know the number m, right? It's 92 in the previous thing, right? Okay, okay. So how do we model this, right? So what does it mean really? What we are saying is that. For each team, a pair of teams x y, there are g x y games that they have to be play between each other, right? And we have to assign each game to either x or y because if two teams play, they have to win. One of them has to win, right? Okay. Now suppose there are ten games left between team x and y. We want to say how many of them we want to give to x, how many of them we want to give to y. Okay. And for every pair of teams, we have to decide that. And we have to have the condition that no other team must win uh, m teams, m games, right? So they already have won x games, and uh, they already lost these games, right? With with z, we already let them lose these games, right? Okay. So how many games, uh, you know, are uh, you know? So uh, how many games uh, does it have to win to reach m? Well, you know, we we it will reach M if uh, if it wins. It already has won W X, uh, and yeah. So among its remaining games, we already made it lose this many, right? So it has to win this many. Uh, uh, Games to get at least m. Okay. Does it make? I mean, maybe the the the, the right way to say it is that. Uh, uh, okay. No. So this is not well phrased. I think. Okay. If you look at any team which is not the z, let's look at x, right? How many wins? It already has w x wins, right? We don't want it to reach m minus w x more than m minus w x. Okay. So. Uh, we, we, it has some games with z. Okay, it has already lost that game. So how many remaining games does it have? Uh, okay, so I, I think this should not be written like this. Each team can uh, win at most. Um, at most, uh, what is going on with this? Sure.
technology I guess. <laughs> okay, this is not working for some reason. Um, Okay, uh, let, let's, this will become clear when we when we uh, to look at an example. Okay, all right. So we, we get the idea, right? You know, we look at a team. We look at how many games can it win. Well, it should not win more than Z, and we know already how many Z will win, right? It is M. We are given M because it has won all the remaining games. So we are assigning the remaining games for between all teams to the teams, right? You know, if there are ten games between X and Y, we have to assign ten, maybe six to X. 4 to y or say 8 to x, 2 to y or whichever combination we desire such that if you look at the total number of wins by x, it should be less than equal to m, okay. That, that's what we are asking, can we assign the remaining games to the team such that nobody wins more than m, okay, all right. So we can, we can, uh, we can phrase this as a, as a, a as a, uh, as the following thing, right? So we think of, you know, uh, the basic idea is that you look at a vertex u x y, which is represents. Uh, okay, so let, let me not uh, go through that. Let's do this, right? So think of this example, right? So what is this left hand side? The left hand side is a set of all pairs of teams. Okay, all pairs of teams, right? How many pairs are there? Well, you know. Because we have already eliminated Boston, because we have given all the games of Boston, there are three teams left, right? And there are three choose two pairs, right? Six, I'm uh, sorry, not, I mean, three choose two is three, not, right? You know, we are counting unordered pairs. So it's New York, Toronto, New York, Baltimore, Bo uh, Baltimore, Toronto. If there are N, N, N teams, then it will be N choose two, okay, on the left hand side, okay? So each of them represents how many games are left between those pairs, okay? So we connect a source to that team with how many games are left, right? You, or you can think of this as an assignment problem where there are six games left between New York and Toronto. On this side, you know, these are teams, New York, Toronto, Baltimore, okay? A game between New York and Toronto can be only assigned to one of these two, right? Yeah? It can't be assigned to this guy. So each guy gets a two edges, you know, one from New York to Toronto, I mean, because of this... Uh, it can be assigned only to Toronto or New York. New York, Baltimore can be only assigned to Baltimore or New York. Okay? And what do we want? We want to make sure, what should we put here? We want to make sure that New York doesn't get more than one win. Right? If it gets more than one win, it will beat Boston because we already know how many Boston is going to win. Right? Okay? So we put, I don't, whatever is the maximum that we are allowing New York to win, that is the capacity of New York. Okay, and this is a, 4 is the capacity of Toronto, why? Because Toronto has won 87 and to beat Boston it has to win 4, okay. And so we say up to 4 will allow, no more than 4, okay. If you put, if it wins 5 it will beat Boston, right. So we put capacity of 4, it means that up to 4 I can do it. And it, Baltimore we allow it up to 3, okay, all right. Okay, so that's it, that's the problem, right? Can we assign these games, how many games here? Six games, one game, one game. Can we assign these games to these teams such that we don't exceed this, right? Okay, so we set up a flow, uh, we start, we, you know, we add a source and put capacity six, capacity one, capacity one, edges. We put a limit 1, 4, 3, okay, and then what capacity should we put here? What is the meaning of this? It is how many games New York, this, how many of these can be assigned to Toronto, right? Now you want to put 1? No, you don't want to put 1, right? Why? Because, you know, there are 6 games left, it could be that, you know, this could be 5 or 4 or whatever it is, right? Okay, so we don't have to put, we can put infinite capacity here because this is controlling how many games are coming in, right? So you could put 6 here if you want, right? 
this capacity you don't want to control it necessarily, right? You can put six or you don't have to put six, you can put infinity if you want. Okay? All right? Make sense? Okay? And now we say, you know, can we, okay, now we, we solve a, a, what should we do? We should assign all the games, right? Okay? Suppose we, so we, we, we solve a max flow problem in this and max flow says, yes, all, what if the max flow says eight, what does it mean? How can we, there, how can max flow in this graph be eight? It means that, remember there's only eight coming here, right? All the eight games were assigned, right? So can you give me a flow of eight on this, in this graph with the infinite capacity here? Can you find a flow of eight on this? Yeah? No, he's saying no. Why, why can't we find a flow of eight on that? I mean, this side is uh, 8, right? You know, maybe it is possible, right? If this side was less than 8, what do we know? It's not possible, right? Okay. Okay, but suppose this side is 8, so is there a feasible assignment? And he's saying no, but I don't know actually, right? You know, why is not possible? Well, you know, you put 6 here, what should we do? Well, we know, look, you know, these six games have to go here and here, right? Okay. Well, you know, there's only four that uh, you can send out. Can I, the total capacity of this is only five, right? And these six have to go to that, so it's not feasible. Okay. But suppose it is feasible, then what do we have? If it is feasible, that is, if we can find a max flow of eight units, that means that we are able to send for everybody that we are able to assign all the games to the teams in such a way that every game is one by is if, if four goes here and two goes here that means that you know we assign the new york toronto games four of them are toronto has one two of them new york has one right that's what the meaning is right and such a way that you know boston still wins the pennant right if you cannot that means you cannot uh, win. Why, why is it a cannot? Why is there a one to one correspondence? Because we know all the capacities are integer, there is a maximum flow which is integer valued, right, which corresponds to assigning games to teams, right. So really we want an integer assignment and we are guaranteed an integer assignment because all the capacities are integer. Okay, so this is an example of an assignment problem, right. If you take out the source and the sink, you can put number 6, 1, 1, right? The capacity of this guy is 1, 4, 3, okay? Then we are asking, can we assign these games to these teams respecting this age constraint? That means that you cannot assign this job to anybody other than these two guys, okay? But by putting infinite capacity, what I am saying is I am not interested in bounding how many games uh, uh, of these six that you want to assign to New York or Toronto. You can decide your any way you want. Okay, but uh, see, we can make the model richer by saying the following, right? Oh, what is the likelihood that all six games will be won by New York and Toronto, right? So maybe we want to say, okay, look, <coughs> going from the past history, it's unlikely that uh, each team will win more, little bit too much more than 50%. So how will you model that? Okay, say, okay, you can try to model it in the following way, right? You can say, look, I'm going to put a capacity of four and four on that. What does it mean? If I put four and four on that, what does it mean? I, right now I'm putting infinity here, but if I put four here and four here, what am I trying to impose? An additional constraint. I'm putting an additional constraint saying that I don't think more each any team will win more than four of their six games right under that more realistic scenario is there a way that boston can win the pennant does it make sense yeah by putting a capacity of four here and four there i'm preventing you from assigning these six games all to one team right no more than four can be assigned to each any team right you can put capacities if you want to get a little bit more refined model right okay but in the plain vanilla version, I'm just saying, you know, put infinity, which means and I am allowing you to put 
six games you can decide however you want okay does the problem make sense okay so we went from the underlying problem is assignment right we can solve assignment easily like matching by putting source and sink and capacities and stuff right but the more difficult maybe thing is to figure out from the baseball problem that we can model it as an assignment problem right it is not obvious right that we could go from this strange looking baseball problem to an assignment problem but when we think about it we say ah it is just deciding whether games can be assigned to teams yeah okay question okay yeah any any question is simple enough okay so you will see many examples of uh, modeling problems as an assignment problem using and each of them you have to think about capacities you have to think about what are the left hand side, what are we trying to assign to who, right? Those are the important things, right? Are we trying to assign, you know, in this case, you know, we had to think a little bit to decide, ah, we are assigning games to teams, right? So, left hand side became all pairs of teams and the right hand side became team, right? So, depending on the application, you have to first figure out, you know, what am I trying to assign to what? What are the constraints? How many objects am I trying to assign? what are the constraints in who can be assigned to who right that defines the edges of the graph and what are the capacities on the edges what am i trying to model you know if, if you don't have any constraint uh, 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 if you don't have any constraint at this point you say okay i'm allowing you putting infinity but you can add more constraints right by putting four and four you're giving some other adding additional constraints okay all that uh, you need to think about Okay, okay, all right. Uh, looks good. Then um, uh, you can look at the reduction correctness and all that stuff uh, uh, in in the uh, okay. Uh, so there is a very nice application of minimum cut to what is called project scheduling. So I thought I will do it. You know, it's one of my favorite applications. Actually, it's a very cute application. Partly because uh, I had a similar problem when I was doing my PhD many years ago and it took me a long time to figure out that you can solve it by max flow, okay. Yeah, you know, it goes, it's hard to see these reductions, right, you know, it, it, you know, it's a little more complicated problem but uh, uh, it took me a long time and, you know, I still, I finally figured it out but it turns out that, you know, it's an old thing, people knew it about it already, right. But still, you know, it, it was nice uh, feeling I still have, oh, I figured it out by myself even though it took me a long time. Right, and it's a very non-trivial reduction. Okay, it's sort of like uh, it always. Uh, it's very hard to understand it in lecture. Okay, uh, because it's it's a little non-trivial reduction. You are going from max to min, a cut, and infinity. It, it is a little tricky reduction, right? but it's a very cute reduction. Okay, uh, so I will. I mean, it's an advanced application. We don't ask. You know, it, it, it's not something that. Uh, uh, you can ask uh, technical problems on because it, you know, related to it, you know, unless you see it. So I won't do it, but I recommend that you read about it, right? In the slides or in Jeff's notes, it's also there. Okay, it's a very cute application. So instead, you know, because we are running out of time uh, with this, uh, with this uh, thing, I want to tell you why flow is so uh, powerful uh, by looking at some generalizations of flow. Okay. And and, uh, and and then we'll we'll uh, if there is time we'll we'll come back uh, come back to it. Okay. Um. Ah, okay. Now it's working. Good. Um. Okay. Um, so you already saw that, right? You know, we we went from flow and to disjoint paths, matchings, assignments, right? And win cards, you know, they're all very powerful tools. So, but flow is the most basic model we saw, right? You know, uh, one source, one sink, right? But then we saw that if you have multiple sources and multiple sinks which are still one commodity, we can easily reduce it to one source, one sink, right? If they're all trying to send oil to refineries, they're all same thing, right? But we have supplies and demands, we could still model it using one source, one sink, right? 
but there are many we already saw this but there are many generalizations and variations which is why flow is very powerful okay so there's something called multi commodity flows which is more uh, realistic about you know s1 s1 wants to send data to a t1 it's not interested in, in you can't mix them right s2 wants to send data to s S T2 and S3 want to send data to S T3 and so on, right? So that's called multi-commodity flows. They're more complicated. You can have flows where there's a notion of time, okay? On each arc, you know, the, it takes some time to go. And there's a notion of uh, losses, right? You know, if you want to model, for example, oil flowing through uh, or gas flowing through pipelines and stuff, you know, it's not a gas will really leak, right? or oil will leak at various places, right? And, and so there is a notion of loss, right? You know, how do you model it? You can do it, you know, there are models for that, but then things get complicated, right? Uh, and then there's what's called minimum cost flow, right? Where there's a, the flow right now, there's no cost to what we did, right? It's just capacity and, right, you know, we'll, okay. And then there is a notion of adding lower bounds in addition to upper bounds for flow and circulations and stuff. So what I'm going to do is, you know, these are quite complicated. We already saw demands and supplies. I'm going to briefly introduce you to these, these uh, concepts, circulations, which are very closely related to flows, lower bounds, and also minimum cost, okay? So that you see the power of flows, and when you see linear programming, you'll say, ah, okay, you can all solve all these via linear programming. So linear programming is even more powerful, right? So let's, let's see some uh, generalizations of flow. Okay. What is a circulation? Circulations are uh, simple variations of flow. So what is flow, right? When we say flow, we said, ah, it's going from source to the sink, right? Okay, but what does it mean it's going from the source to the sink? It means that any intermediate vertex, the incoming flow has to go to outgoing flow, right? So they're not doing anything, right? Flow, flow, so it's going from uh, source to the sink. Okay, in circulations, there is no source, no sink. Okay, that's why it's called circulation. You're cycling around doing nothing, right? Okay, so what does it mean? A, formally, what is a circulation? Formally, a circulation is just a, a set of numbers to the edges, like just like flow, except that, you know, we only have capacity constraint and flow conservation constraint, no source and sink. So it means that, you know, every vertex flow incoming is going flow outgoing. You say, well, what is the point of this, you'll say, right? But the definition is clear. It is, at every vertex, incoming flow is going to be outgoing flow, okay? And you, flow should respect capacities, okay? There is no source, no sink. So flow is going from nowhere to nowhere, right? You're just running around in the graph, okay? Okay, so you say, you know, it's not very, it's like, why would you run around in the graph, right? What is the notion of, what are you trying to optimize? Because Zero, zero is a, if you put a zero on everything, it's a circulation, right? You're not maximizing or anything like that, right? You know, what's the point of this thing, right? Okay, no source, no sink. Okay. Flow circulations are interesting or natural when you say, aha, uh -huh, I, I also have a lower bound on each arc and not just an upper bound capacity, okay? So what do we have now? We have an additional number for each edge. We have an upper bound capacity. And we also have a lower bound, which says that, you know, I should have at least this much flow on each arc. Okay? Right? Okay. So now, remember, previously we, we said, you know, flow is in, on each edge should be a number between zero and the capacity, right? Now we say, no, no, you need to have at least some number, a lower bound on each arc. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. So what is a circulation now? A circulation satisfies flow conservation at each vertex, and it, on each edge, the flow on the edge should be less than the capacity, and it should be at least the lower bound. Obviously, the lower bound should be less than the capacity, otherwise it's not feasible, right? Okay? Yeah? Okay. Now you say, okay, now, now the question is, uh, what is the problem, right? Now the problem is, I give you a network with capacity Cs and lower bounds L, you ask, is there any, any circulation? Now, I'm not even asking, you know, optimize anything. Is there a circulation? Okay. The lower bounds make the problem hard, right? Now, now you can't put zero on every arc, right? If you put zero on every arc, it is a circulation. 
but it won't satisfy the lower bound capacity constraint, right? So now I'm mean, simply asking a feasibility question. I give you a graph and upper bounds and lower bounds on each arc. Is there a circulation in this graph? Okay. All right. No source, no sink, right? Okay. The thing is, this is actually a very hard problem, I claim. Right? Why do, uh, let's see why it is hard, right? Because I can show you that if you can solve this problem, you can solve the old max flow problem from source to sink. Okay? So it's not an easy problem. Okay? Okay, why, why is that, why is that uh, easy? Right? So what is the max flow problem? The max flow problem is I give you a network with only capacities, right? no lower bounds. Lower bounds are 0. And source and sink. And let's look at the decision version of max flow. What is the decision version of max flow? I give you a number f and I ask, can you send a flow of value f from s to t in this graph? You ideally want to maximize f, right? That's called a max flow problem. But I, I can now look at the decision problem. I give you a number f and say, is the max flow at least f? OK, is that OK? So if you solve the decision problem, you can solve the optimization problem by doing binary search, right? Yeah? OK. Now the question is, you know, can I reduce this problem to the circulation problem? OK, what is this problem really saying, right? I give you a graph, you know, this is G, you know, this, like for simplicity, you know, I put S here and uh, T here, OK? I want to know, is there a maximum flow of S to, from S to T with uh, a value at least F, OK? I claim I can reduce it to a circulation problem as follows, OK? What I do is, I put an arc from T to S, OK? Right? Let's, and then I put the lower bound on this arc to be f and upper bound to be infinity. Okay. On every other arc in the original graph, the lower bound is 0, upper bound is C. When is there a circulation in this graph? Okay. What is the circulation? Right? Circulation just, there is no source sink, right? But what is this lower bound saying? It says, you know, f units of flow have to go on from t to s, right? Because the lower bound is f. I don't care how much you send, right? But if f units comes here, where is that flow going to go? Because the circulation, right? Okay? It has to go from s to t. Okay? My claim is there is a feasible circulation in this graph if and only if there is a maximum, there is a flow of value f from s to t in the original graph. Does it make sense or no? Yeah? Agreed? Okay. So circulations are more, I mean, or look more general than flow, right? Because you can easily reduce maximum flow to circulation with just one arc having lower bound, right? Okay? Because he's saying, you know, you have to force for F units on this thing. That's possible only if you send F from S to T in the original graph. Yeah? All right, so circulations are powerful, right? Okay, uh, this is the reduction you can, uh, right? Okay. Now the thing is, you know, you say, you know, circulations seem more powerful. Are they really more powerful? Okay, it turns out that's not true. In fact, you can reduce circulation problem to max flow. Okay. You can solve circulation by using max flow, even with circulations with a lower bound. Right? The circulations are more interesting only when they're lower bounds. Otherwise, it is not interesting, right? But circulations with lower bounds can be reduced to max flow without lower bounds, just like the, the standard max flow problem. So they're not very different. They're equivalent in some sense, right? But why are circulations interesting? Because they are more natural in some situations where there is no source and sink, and we just want flow going around in cycles. You can think of it like that, okay? And so there are more modeling power, and lower bounds are more also very useful. And so we'll see an application. Some important properties of circulations because they're very closely related to flows, right? So here are some, I mean, uh, you know, if you're interested in the reduction, uh, you should look at this chapter on by klein mogan -Tadosh. It's a very nice, clean reduction, right? How to solve circulations using flow, okay? Lower bounds and stuff. You know, you take a series of steps, all very natural, and you'll see it's very powerful. Okay? First, you know, you can solve whether there is a feasible circulation in a graph with lower bounds and upper bounds. You, because you can reduce it to the max flow problem, you can solve it in O of M and time, just like uh, flow. 
if edge capacities and lower bounds are integer valued, there is always a feasible integer valued circulation, which is nice, right? Because just like flow, is, there exists a maximum flow which is integer valued. When our capacities are integer valued, here if both lower bounds and upper bounds are integer valued, there always exists a feasible, I mean, if there is a feasible one, it, there is a feasible integer valued one. And you can find it. And there is a natural generalization of Maxlow Mincut theorem to, it's again, it's a, not a very natural Maxlow Mincut theorem called Hoffman circulation theorem. Okay, I'm not going to state it because it's very natural if you think about it, it's the right condition, right? But I won't state it. But it has, you know, because it, it is uh, Maxwell min cut is useful, just like that Hoffman circulation theorem is natural in some settings. And again, remember flow we thought of as uh, paths from S to T, right? Circulation, there is no paths, right? There is just a collection of cycles, right? Any circulation can be decomposed into a collection of M cycles, just like we did with flow. Take a cycle and remove it. Take a cycle and remove it, okay? You can, just like you take removed paths and cycles, right? Any flow can be decomposed into paths and cycles. Here there are no paths possible because there is no S and T. So you can only decompose into cycles. Circulation by the name means it's a collection of cycles, basically. Okay? So it's again the same algorithm will give you a circulation can be decomposed into collection of cycles. Okay? And you can do it efficiently as well. So these are important properties, okay? Uh, here is a nice example where uh, why lower bounds are useful, right? Okay. Why lower bounds are useful? Um, so you get an assignment problem with uh, with uh, some lower bounds, right? So let's let's think about a simple uh, application like this. Okay. So here is a abstract problem, right? You know, you are designing a survey, right? There are n products and n customers, right? Okay. So there are n one products and n two customers, and you know. So you know what, what products each customer has purchased, right? For example, Amazon knows what, what we're doing, right? You know, or, or, or many people know what we're doing, right? Okay, you cannot ask a customer about a product they haven't purchased, okay? Right? So that's one constraint, right? For each product, we know which customers bought it, so we can only ask questions to them. You don't want to overload the customers, right? If you ask too many questions, people will uh, not answer, right? Okay, so you can only ask about uh, some bound uh, on each uh, each uh, uh, person I can be asked only C prime I products, and you don't want to ask them one question, right? You know that will be kind of uh, maybe they'll say, you know, why are you asking about one one product, right? But maybe you have a you know you say, okay, no, the survey should have at least five questions, but no more than ten questions, right? Something like that. So for each customer, you have a lower bound of how many questions you should ask and an upper bound of how many questions you should not ask, okay? Too many is bad, too little is also bad, right? Okay? And for each product, we want enough information, right? You know, we say, okay, look, you know, if you don't get enough information on the product, then it's not very good because we're not enough customers are answering. So we want a lower bound on how many uh, customers we should ask and, you know, a maximum, you know, we don't want to ask more than so many because it's useless, right? Each of these could be infinity or zero depending on your application. Now the question is this, right? Uh, can we design a survey knowing the graph of which product was bought by which customer which satisfies this constraint? Can we build surveys for the customers such that a customer is only asked questions about products they bought. They should not be asked more than the, their upper bound number of products and should not be asked less than their lower bound products. And each product gets at least this many, is in the survey of at least this many customers and no more than that many customers. Right? Uh, at most that and at least this many. Right? Okay, this is an assignment problem, right? We are assigning questions to, survey questions to customers, right? Okay, so we have, you know, you know, you can think of it as a products are, uh, I, I mean, this is flipped. You can think of, you know, these are cust consumers and these are products are other way, doesn't matter. There's an edge from uh, a consumer to a product if they bought that product, yeah, natural. 
Okay? Now, for each, you add a source and you add a sink, and you say, okay, look, you know, from this source, I'll add to each customer I an edge, and the lower bound on the edge is CI, and the upper bound on the edge is C prime I. That means, you know, I want to, it represents that, you know, the number of questions you can ask this is between CI and CI prime, right? And for each uh, product J, you again have a upper bound, lower bound and upper bound of how many customers you should assign to that product or how many customers you'll ask that question, right? Okay? So now we have lower bounds and upper bounds and what about, you know, we can only ask one question between, we, I mean, if you look at any, this edge, what does it represent that we can't ask, you know, if there are, we can't ask the same customer more than one question about a product, right? So the capacity on this edge should be one and we don't have to ask that customer, so the lower bound is zero. Okay? Okay, and then we add an arc back to here, you know, we put like this, like this, like this, you know, all these are directed and, you know, we, we put zero infinity. We don't care, there are no other constraints. We only want to make sure that at least for each product, at least this many question, people are asked and no more than that. Each customer is not asked more questions than within this, no more than this many questions, no less than this many questions. And this is the constraint and suddenly, you know, you say, is there a circulation in this graph? Okay. If there is a feasible circulation because they're all integer valued, you'll get what? What does a feasible circulation represent once you have it? We know it will be integer valued because all the lower bounds and upper bounds are integer valued, right? We'll get, you know, this, some of these edges will get one, some of them will get zero, right? If you look at any particular customer, then all the ones leaving that guy are the products that we're going to ask, right? And in the survey for that customer, right? And they satisfy all the constraints, right? So see, you see lower bounds are coming up naturally, right? Okay? When you have lower bound, circulations are more natural. Okay? Okay? Is it clear? Yeah? It's very simple. It's not complicated. It's a modeling power, right? You, you have a modeling power once you have lower bounds and circulations, okay? Questions? Clear? Okay? Yeah? Any, any, any questions on this? Yeah. Where lower bounds are powerful here? Okay. All right, that's one variation, right? You know, uh, now I want to spend a little bit of time on minimum cost flows, okay? Just what is it, you know, why is it useful and stuff like that. Okay? So, now we are back to flows, not circulations, though we can talk about minimum cost circulations also, but let's just go to flows, right? ST flow, previously we had only capacity on the, on the, on the uh, edges, right? No, no, no other number. Now, for each edge, there is also a cost associated with it, okay? Uh, some number, right? And because, you know, cost also is C, we'll call it weight. W, right, you know, because capacity is C, you know, cost is C, so it will be a bit of a problem, right, the notation. So we'll use W of E to really represent the cost, okay, or weight, if you want, okay. So there are two numbers, right, capacity and cost, and there are two problems you want. Initially, suppose we want to find a maximum flow, right, you know, that there's no notion of cost there, right, we just found a maximum flow. Now, we want to find a maximum flow among all maximum flows, we want to find the one with the minimum cost. Okay, that's one problem. Another nice problem to think about is, I give you the amount of flow I want, and then say I want to find the maximum uh, flow of at least that many units with minimum cost. Okay, because we're trying to minimize the cost, if you don't require at least so much flow, you'll put zero flow on it, right? Okay. So we're saying, you know, give me a flow of minimum cost, but you have to send at least 10 units. Okay, that's one way of thinking about it. The other way is like, you have to give me a maximum flow. Among all maximum flows, minimize the cost of the flow. So what is the cost of a flow? It is simply defined as the sum over all edges, the weight on the edge times the flow on that edge. Okay? Okay? All right, is it clear? I mean, for the most applications, costs will be non-negative, 
but costs can be negative. This model doesn't, uh, you, you can put costs to be negative. If costs are negative, it means that you're trying to maximize the thing, uh, because negation means, right? So, and those has, uh, the, 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 you can use that. For, in, so, let's, we are not going to assume that costs are non-negative, okay? We'll just leave it like that. If the cost can be negative, an optimum solution may need cycles, okay? Okay, I'll, I'll give you an example. But why is, why is, uh, why is uh, minimum cost flow interesting, right? Clearly, it's a more general problem, right? You know, if I put cost equal to zero, I'm still solving the maximum flow problem, right? You want a maximum flow. But it, it is very powerful because you can, uh, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can um, uh, solve a lot of interesting problems because many times you want to find things which are not only feasible but also of low cost, right? So let's look at uh, the shortest path problem. Why is the shortest path problem a special case of minimum cost flow? So suppose I give you a graph, right? I want to, okay? Suppose I give you a graph, a directed graph, and this is S for simplicity, you know, it looks like this and, okay? I want to find the shortest path from S to T. For simplicity, I assume all the edge lengths are non-negative, okay? I claim that I can solve this by using minimum cost flow or in, in a very simple way, or it's, a, it's no, you can reduce it to minimum cost flow. So minimum cost flow is more general. Yeah? Costs are one or capacities are one? Okay, there's one more I thing you need to do, right? Okay, how many units of flow do you want? One unit of flow, right? Okay, so how do you, so it depends on which model you want to use, right? Do you want to use this model or this model? Because the maximum flow between S and T could be much larger, right? So why are these two problems the same, by the way? Roughly the same. Or let me ask you the following, how can you reduce that problem to this problem, okay? I want to find a minimum cost flow of value f from s to t, find a minimum cost flow, minimum cost maximum s t flow. Why are, why can, how can you reduce that to this? So for example, in the, in the shortest path, I want a flow of one unit from s to t, right? But the, there could be may, a lot of flow between s and t in the graph. How can I constrain the flow from S to T be not more than one unit? Add some dummy source and sink, what happens? Okay, so here is what I can do, right? I can add a new source, right? And put capacity one on that. What happens now? Now, with the new source, I put a cut of one, right? You know, I'm four, they, I can't have more than one unit of flow from S prime to T, right? Okay? So, I can put whatever number, I can put F there, right? I can constrain the amount of flow that goes from S to T by adding a dummy source and putting an arc of capacity F between S prime and S and now compute the flow from S to S prime to T, okay? These are all small tricks, but you should get used to them. Okay. okay, now I claim that, you know, remember shortest path problem has what? Lens on the edges, right? Right? Le. I make the weight or the cost of my flow to be equal to Le on each edge, and I put capacity of 1 on each edge, and I do this thing, and I ask, find me a minimum cost maximum flow. Well, we know the maximum flow is 1 unit because we constrain it to be 1 unit. I claim it's exactly, the value of that is exactly the length of the shortest path. Why? Look at the shortest path from S to T. Clearly, you know, we can send one unit of flow along that path, right? Okay? Agreed? So, the, uh, my minimum cost flow is no more than the length of the shortest path, right? Because one times one unit of flow is going on each edge. My cost is the same as the length. So, my total cost of the flow, if you look at this formula, it will be length times one unit, so it will give you the length of the path. So, if I send one unit along the shortest path, 
my cost of the flow will be exactly the length of the shortest path, that length of the path. And we might as well pick the shortest path length, right? Okay, but why should it be at least the length of the shortest path? Okay, let's look at uh, one unit of flow from S to T, right? I can do flow decomposition, right? What does it mean? That means I'm sending one unit along maybe many paths, right? That means you know point 0.1 along this path, point 0.2 along this path, point 0.3 along this path, point 0.4 along those paths, right? Okay, but if I send point 0.4 along a path, how much cost am I paying on that path? Point 0.4 times the length of that path, right? Point 0.1 times the length of this path, point 0.2 times the length of this path, right? Okay. Okay, but uh, then there are each of those is at least the shortest path, right? So together I'm paying at least the length of the shortest path from in the cost of the flow, right? So minimum cost flow of one unit from S to T is exactly the length of the shortest path from S to T. Does it make sense? No? Yes, no. So here, see, here is an example, right? Uh, just to see, right, you know, um, suppose I have, a, I have a graph which looks like this. Okay, so there are two shortest paths in this graph, right? Yeah, both are length 10 basically, right? Okay, now I can send one unit of flow along this or one unit along this and that both the costs will be what? 10, right? But I can send 0.5 here and 0.5 here, right? That flow also will have a cost of 10, right? Okay, so to minimize the cost of the flow, I should not use more any, if I use a, short, a path which is not shortest path, then I will have more cost than I should use, right? So that's not minimum because I can transfer that flow onto a shorter path and reduce the cost, right? So one unit of flow from S to T of minimum cost is exactly the shortest path length from S to T, okay? Agreed? Okay, so the only trick happens here, we, suppose, you know, I, I, I have this and I also have this cycle sitting around here and the costs are not non-negative like this, okay. Now what happens? The flow will say, aha, I'm going to send one, I mean, one unit along that cycle also, right, okay. Even though it's not going from S to T, even though you want only one unit of flow from S to T, if you have non-negative lens, the minimum cost flow will take advantage of that because it, it will reduce its cost, right? What is it? Okay, so then, so basically what happens is that if the leg, lens are negative, then you won't get the shortest path length because you will have some cycles in the flow because it can take advantage of it, okay? So, the, so I mean, but that, that, that is useful in some settings, okay, we'll, we'll see. Okay. So, that is the minimum cost flow problem. Minimum cost flow problem is very nice because remember matching, right, assignment. Now, you can put costs on those edges and say, you know, if you assign this job to that person, you will get, you will have to pay this much, okay. And now, you want an assignment which minimizes the cost of the assignment. You can easily reduce it to minimum cost flow, right, okay. So costs are very powerful because you are able to solve the assignment problem with additional costs on the thing and so you can find among all ways of assigning jobs to people, find me the one which minimizes the cost and that's a very powerful application, right? So the po point about minimum cost flow is that first fact is that you can solve it efficiently. It's a more complicated problem than just solving max flow but it can be solved efficiently in polynomial time, okay? That's one thing you need to know and moreover, the following property is also true that if the flow, if the capacities are integral, then there exists a minimum cost flow which is integral. Remember, cost can be arbitrary. As long as the capacities are integral, there is always a minimum cost flow which is integral, okay? 
as long as the capacities are integral. That is very important in the assignment problem, right? The assignment problem requires you or many of these applications require you to have the flow being integral, okay? And you can still have the flow being integral as long as uh, the capacities are integral. So that is very important. Okay, just a couple of things. How do you solve minimum cost flow? Right? What, you know, why should we be able to solve minimum cost flow? So let's let's think about uh, uh, the residual graph again, you know, and, and see the following. Remember, when we had a graph and a flow, what was the residual graph? We simply put forward arcs and backward arcs and put uh, the right amount of capacity, right? Okay, now we have costs. So how should we think about costs, right? What does the forward arc mean in the residual graph? It means that we can send that much flow left, there is so much capacity left on the, on the arc, right? The current, capa current flow is Fe, we still have Ce minus Fe capacity left on that arc. So suppose we are in the cost regime, the cost of the arc does not change in the residual graph, right, if it is a forward arc, because we are trying to increase flow on that, okay? But what about the re reverse arc? What does the meaning of the reverse arc mean in, in the residual graph? It means that if you send flow on the reverse arc, we are reducing the flow, right? Okay, but when you have costs, if you reduce the flow, your cost should go down, right? Okay, so what you do is, the only thing you do is that if you are a forward arc, you keep the cost of the arc to be the same. If it is a reverse arc, you, you make the cost to be negative of the cost, okay? So reducing flow on arc should reduce your cost, right? Okay? So that's the definition of the residual graph when you have costs. Okay, now you see, even though your original graph has non-negative costs, in the residual graph suddenly what? You may have negative costs, right? Right? So even though you, you if you try to work only with uh, uh, non-negative costs, you realize that you will still get negative costs in the residual graph. So you cannot escape this, so we might as well live with cost being arbitrary, negative, positive, we don't care. Okay. Okay, now we can ask the following thing, right? Suppose we have a maximum flow from S to T in the graph. We want to find a minimum cost maximum flow, right? So I first compute a maximum flow, right? I don't care about cost, compute a maximum flow. Now I look at the graph and say, how can I know whether it is a minimum cost flow or not? Okay. Is there a simple way to check whether a given flow, which is maximum, is minimum cost or not, right? Okay, how do you know whether a flow is maximum flow or not? In the residual graph, there cannot be any path from S to T, right? Okay, so now we did that. We found a maximum flow. Now, there is no path from S to T in the residual graph. But how do we know it's a minimum cost flow? Maybe there are multiple minimum cost, I mean, there could be a better flow even though in terms of cost, even though the value of the flow is the same, right? How can I check? And there is a very simple condition. A cost is, a flow is a minimum cost flow if and only if in the residual graph there is no negative length cycle, okay? If there is a negative length cycle, what does it intuitively mean? Okay, if there is a negative length cycle, you can augment along the cycle. See, augmenting along cycles does not change the value of the flow from S to T, right? So if we stay a minimum, a maximum flow, there cannot be a path from S to T in the residual graph because it is a maximum flow, right? But there can be cycles, right? Okay, if there is a cycle and it has negative cost, it means that we can go around that cycle and reduce our cost. It means the, the current flow is not a minimum cost flow. So it is not a proof, but you can go over it more carefully. But it's a very easy condition to check, right? If I give you a cycle, if I give you a maximum flow and I saw, is this a minimum cost flow? You compute the residual graph, you check whether there's a negative length cycle or not. Do we know how to check whether there's a negative length cycle in the graph? Yes? Yes? How? Bellman Ford, right? We know how to check whether there's a negative length cycle in the graph, right? That's why shortest, there's a, so you check, is there a negative length cycle? No, great, I am already an optimum minimum cost flow. Done. If it is not a minimum cost cycle, what do you say? Just like augmenting path, you say, ha, I found a negative length cycle. That means if I send flow along the cycle, my cost will go down. So let's send cycle, uh, keep, send one unit of flow around the cycle, and I'll go one, keep doing it, right? Just like Ford-Fulkerson, it's a very simple cycle canceling algorithm. You, you, what is the algorithm? 
you compute a max flow first, do not care about costs, okay, do not care about costs. Then you look at the residual graph and say, is there a negative length cycle? Ah, if it is, I go around the cycle, reduce the cost by at least one unit, okay. If there is no negative length cycle, victory, done, okay. Just like uh, Ford Fulkers and uh, augmenting path algorithm, there is no path from STT in the residual graph, you have a maximum flow, right. So just like that, you check a negative length cycle, if there is one, you update, uh, augment and otherwise you say you are done, okay. The only problem is this algorithm is that it is also not it will take a long time because we are not choosing the cycles carefully, right. But choosing the cycle carefully is more complicated in minimum cost flow. It is uh, it's, so I will not go into the details of that, but you can choose nice cycles and you will get a strongly polynomial running time, okay. So that is not the issue, but just this idea that we can easily check whether a given flow is a minimum cost max flow or not by just checking a negative cycle in the residual graph and you can use that to so there is another very simple algorithm which is also very natural, but this works only if the costs are non-negative, okay, okay. So what was that algorithm? That algorithm was start with the maximum flow and keep improving the cost, right. We, st we stay maximum flow and we keep increasing the cost, right. Does it make sense? We always are at the maximum flow, we keep improving the cost till we get the optimum cost. This one is called successive shortest path algorithm, it is the most natural algorithm you can think of, right, okay. Here is the thing, if I want to find flow of one unit from S to T of minimum cost, what is it we saw earlier? One unit, shortest path, right, you find a shortest path and that is it, you are done, right, okay. It works only because the lengths are non-negative, if there are cycles that is different, right, okay. You find the shortest path, you are done, right, you found the optimal solution. But suppose I say I want two units of flow, okay. How do you find two units of flow in the general, if you, if you do not care about the cost? You found one path, you want to find one more unit, right. So you find the residual graph and find uh, any path from S to T, okay. So now you can say, okay, look, I found the shortest path, I look at the residual graph. And I find another shortest path in the residual graph. Magically, that will give you the, it will work. It will give you the two units of flow with the minimum cost, okay. Do you see? So, I want to route k units of flow from S to T of minimum cost. For k equal to 1, what is it? Shortest path, okay. But we only have one unit, right? We need to increase the flow. What do you do in the normal increasing the flow? We find a residual graph and find an augmenting path, right? So here we just do the same thing, we find the residual graph, we find not any arbitrary augmenting path, but the shortest path according to the costs, okay. So now we have two units of flow, now we can ask, do I have an optimum two unit cost flow? Turns out yes, okay, as long as the cost, initial cost, remember the initial costs have to be non-negative, but in the residual graph we will get negative length edges, okay. And finding shortest path with negative length edges, you need to use Bellman Ford. But what you can prove is that if the initial costs are non-negative, at no point will you get a negative length cycle in this algorithm. You will not find any negative length cycle throughout the, this algorithm and you will actually get at each stage, you will get the optimum cost flow. This is called a successive shortest paths, right. You find shortest path, you find the residual graph, find another shortest path and keep doing it. Okay, this also will work. We, we will not worry about the proof right now. Uh, but it is a very simple algorithm and uh, cycle cancelling is the other simple algorithm and what about uh, maximum profit flow, okay. Instead of saying you know minimum cost maximum flow, I want maximum profit, how will you find that, okay. What is the definition? You have not given your definition, right. So each edge has a profit PE. Okay, and my prof flow profit is okay. I want to find the ST maximum flow of maximum profit. Can I solve this?
Well, you know, you say, why, you know, finding a maximum profit flow is the same as negating minimum cost, right? Okay. But the only catch is what happened. My initial profits could be positive. When I negate, I get negative numbers. Okay. But when I have negative costs, I can get, I can solve this problem according to this definition, right? But you may get some cycles in the flow. Okay. And in some applications, that is not, that's not useful. But in some other application, it's fine. So, according to the formal definition, this is no different than minimum cost flow, right? Because to find a maximum profit flow, you negate all the numbers and find a minimum cost flow, okay? Depends on your application whether you want the profits to be non-negative or not, okay? All right? Because if you, when you go to minimum cost, you may get cycles, okay? You will see some examples in the homework and stuff. Okay, so these are all the flow variants you need to know. You need to know circulations and lower bounds and minimum cost flows and that some basic properties of those because they'll be useful in applications. And next week, Ruta is going to do linear programming, okay, because we are kind of done with flow at this point, okay. And so this is, the, this is the, basically the end of the material for the second midterm, okay. We won't have linear programming in the midterm, okay, only in the final, right, okay. All right.